Hello again, welcome back inside the Tier 4 studio in Morgantown, West Virginia. For the Charleston Daily Mail, I remain Mike Casaza, and to the best of my knowledge, the only person on campus with a head cold in the first week of August. So I'm going to try to get through this in one lozenge today. If I'm hoarse, if I'm brief, I'm sorry, it's my first week of practice too, and I will get better from this. So as we move on here, first day out on the grass that the media gets to see. They went out from the stadium, went to the practice field at the top of the hill next to the indoor practice facility. And I don't know what it is about that. It always seems like guys are a little bit more excited to practice out in the grass. Reason being, you spend a lot of time, and if you're a veteran, you know this, you spend a lot of time inside the stadium practicing, certainly playing. You have stands around you, scoreboards. It's gray in there. It's bland. And when there's nobody in there, there's a lot better places to be. I think that's one reason Dana Holberson doesn't like to practice out there so much. It's not very inspiring. Go outside in the hill. I don't know what's the difference between grass and turf these days for players because the turf is so much like grass. But... I don't know, maybe it's more fun for them. The music's out there. It's founded by trees and hall, uh, excuse me, walls of, of you know hillside as opposed to walls of empty stands. And I don't know, maybe it's a little bit more liberating. Maybe that invigorates the players. There always seems to be a little bit more energy out there the first couple times they do this. And they can't do it very often, so uh, maybe it's a treat for the players. Not for everybody, though. A couple guys in red we had not seen before. Cornerback Nana Kyram was limping around the field doing his requisite laps if you wear red. Didn't have a brace or a pad or anything. Maybe it's uh, an ankle or a hamstring, not something that's unusual. They had to blow out a leg or something like that in the first day of practice, first week of practice when maybe your legs aren't as warm as they need to be. Also, Grant Lingefelter, freshman from Ohio, a black walking boot on his left foot. Not really sure what that was. Didn't get um, much information on that. Did lead to a funny moment, though. Uh, Lingefelter was walking around in a red 62 jersey. And 62 is, of course, worn by Curtis Fight. And Fight is a wily veteran. He knows when the media is around. Thunderkind, if you will. And within earshot of reporters, he politely reminded Lingafelter that he need not wear 62 in the future. And maybe he should go with something different so people don't confuse the injured freshman with the uh, seasoned senior who is going to be your starting right tackle more likely than not the regular season and just doesn't miss a lot of practice time. Other than that, everybody healthy, look right there, ready to go. Adam Panky, of course, another guy in red. He's going to be out probably for the rest of the season, I would think. But they mentioned maybe October. This is back in the spring when he heard an ACL. He's walking around there doing laps. But they're cultivating some depth in the offensive line, some combinations, some contingency plans for, you know, Nick Kendler at both tackle spots. Can Edgar play inside or outside? Is Golinski going to be a right guard? Things like that. It's moving quickly. So maybe the time's working against Panky, but he'll have some more time with him there. I think they liked him a lot. Nothing's going to change about that as long as he rehabilitates properly. And by all indications, he's ahead of schedule there. Uh, the acclimatization period, five days of that, as you know, if you were around before, West Virginia kicked that around like a pinata in 2010 and broke the rules and had to self-report themselves. Not the case anymore. You have compliance out there all the time making sure you don't do that. But first two days, just helmets, jerseys, and shorts. Days three and four, you can add shoulder pads. Day five, which is tomorrow, you can wear the whole shebang and start knocking people around. And that's what things will get interesting when players will start to maybe distinguish themselves. Maybe you see more uh, red and green jerseys out there. But um, from what we understand, the first day in the sh just shoulder pads wasn't very smooth. That's not unusual. Our guys have been running around all summer, haven't really done full pads since the spring. So you put on shoulder pads, you're not quite as uh, sharp, as fluid as you were before. Today looked better just in the part that we saw. It seemed like that the coaches were a little bit more impressed with some of the ease of movement out there. There weren't as many restrictions, but you know, everybody looks good in shorts and a t-shirt, they say. That's the old coach cliche. Not everybody looks good in shoulder pads. Some people look different. Some people look like they're swimming in shoulder pads. Some people look like the shoulder pads were specifically built for them. I think we all know that a guy like Will Clark or Jared Barber probably looks good in shoulder pads. You know, physically mature guys who've been around and hit the weight room and have grown. Um, but there are some other people on that defensive side. And I'll point out the defense because Offensively, guys like Jackie Marcellus, or, or not to pick on him, but smaller guys on the offense, you can make a living out there. 5'8", 180, you can fly around, catch passes, it's hard to catch you, hard to hit you. Defensively, you don't have that same ability to hide shortcomings physically. Um, but West Virginia doesn't really have that problem in a lot of spots. Like, you know, the defensive line and the whole group um, gives them something they haven't had in a long time. I was thinking maybe since the Doug Slavani, Chris Neal, Scooter Berry days, and they had some big, big bodies up there they could throw at you. Uh, West Virginia's defensive ends are Will Clark, very big, we know that. On the other end, Kyle Rose, a sophomore who's, you know, 6'3", 280, 290. So, I mean, these are big, big guys out there. And in the middle, you punk Shaq Rowell, the senior who's about 300 pounds. I mean, these are big guys that can play in the middle. Now, what they're going to do, they're going to let them go. They're going to play two or three series, and they're going to sub in a whole other line. Kind of like uh, line shifts in hockey or maybe, um, you know, quarterbacks at the old Steve Spurrier days. let the one quarterback play three series, and the other guy would come in. They get to blame for the defensive line this year. Well, their second string, how about this? Uh, you're going to have Noble Nwachukwu or um, Eric Kinsey. 
if we're going to be playing at one end position, probably Dontrell Hyman at the other if Hyman doesn't move over and maybe nudge out Kyle Rose. But uh, Hyman's 6'4", 280, 37 inch vertical, he can run about a 4'8", maybe a 4'7". I mean, a basketball player who's playing football. Um, that's another end, and in the middle you put Christian Brown, who, I kid you not, is every bit as big as Shaq Rowell looks like. Uh, that's a continuity of, of a big, massive, thick, hard-to-move bodies on the defensive line. That's great news for West Virginia up front. Linebackers, you know a lot of the names, Doug Rigg, Terry Barber, Nick Witowski, we've gone over them. But the new guys kind of pop off the page at you a little bit. Al Rashid Benton, the freshman, you know, 6'2", 225, it looks like. He can move around, make some plays. But Brandon Golson um, does not look like a lot of the other guys there, especially that outside position. I'd be very surprised as long as he takes care of his business, if he's on an every-down guy who can play the run, who can cover, who can move around, doesn't have to come off the field. I don't think they want to necessarily a platoon there like with the Josh Francis, Tyler Anderson before. And if you remember, they moved away from that and played Josh Francis almost exclusively there at the end of the year. Uh, I think that's Golson's job to earn. Not necessarily lose, but I think they want to give a guy like that a position to, um, to really prosper with. Cornerbacks, you know, what do you think now? Probably 5'10", 5'11". Not necessarily. Travis Bell was moved from the safety position to corner. And Daryl Worley, a freshman from the Philadelphia area, 6'2", about 190. He's playing cornerback right now. This may be the new trend here. Larger, taller cornerbacks be more physical with this plethora of receivers in the Big 12, some big guys on the outside there, so hey, fire versus fire, you get a big cornerback. You know about the safeties, Carl Joseph, Darwin Cook, there's two freshmen back there, they're not very deep back there still, uh, but um, the freshmen, Malik Greaves and Jeremy Tyler, two guys first year, haven't been here very long, but they're big, they're, they just don't look like Cook and Joseph, they're bigger than them, obviously Cook and Joseph are good players, we don't know about the freshmen, but physically, I mean, they might give themselves a chance, a la KJ Dillon last year, didn't play a whole lot, but just because of necessity and the fact that you know, his body was kind of prepared to play. Um, I think that's probably the situation with these other two freshmen, and also they're going to be developed, I think, because they need guys back there. Jared Harper, the only other name that I haven't mentioned, that's really in the position for a safety spot. And then um, two other guys I want to mention, um, Mike Caliccio, that's 6'9", offensive lineman who's playing in the middle of the pump block shield. Um, I just think it's funny to see him out there. He doesn't look like anybody else out there tall and, and big, probably 325 pounds, I would guess, just by looking at the roster and how big he probably is. And also, um, Eli Wellman from Cabell County uh, is 6'3", 235, and is listed as a receiver. I don't know if that's just because that's what they're calling the types like Eli Wellman or Cody Clay or uh, Will Johnson these days, but um, they put him out to run some receiver routes, and he looked like he could actually play that spot. Maybe he gets a job or at least in time as a, as a tight end sometime in his career. But I think because, again, he's really that only, you know, quote-unquote fullback, he's got a chance. Some other receiver things, um, they went with their some just inside-outside plays at the very end of the period that we got to see. And um, outside receivers, you had Kevin White and Jordan Thompson. They went with each other on one, so that's kind of where that's going to shake out. No surprise there. What was interesting to me, though, was the next rep was Ronald Carswell and Mario Alford. Carswell was outside, Alford was inside, and behind them, coming out of the backfield, was Charles Sims. Did some homework. That is, that is some order there. Probably your three fastest players on offense, and if they're going to take the field in one formation, uh, that right side of the field is not going to be a fun place to be if you're a linebacker or a cornerback or a safety, and you got to keep your eyes on all three of those guys. Uh, apart from that, not much else going on there. Again, exciting, I think, for the players to be out there. You saw some guys in red, and you're probably going to see some more soon. They really start hitting tomorrow, but uh, really physically, when they put the pads on, you get a difference, and I think beyond that, the performance in the pads, when they start hitting each other, people start to impose their will or back off from conflicts like that. Uh, some of those storylines will begin to develop tomorrow, and um, that's when we will resume our action here. So if you'll excuse me, I have a Ricola waiting in the corner. I will see you soon.